good evening. May peace be upon us. I um, have a question for you all. The answer is always no. <coughs> is there anything in human beings that escape all limitations and of which we as human beings enjoy absolute freedom. In other words, as human beings, is there anywhere in life that we enjoy 100% of freedom? Thought. Say that again. Thought. Freedom of thought. That's what we are going to talk. Our thoughts are the only thing that we have 100% freedom of, right? We don't have 100% freedom of action, right? We don't have 100% uh, freedom of exercising our thoughts. But what goes on in our minds, we are 100% free to think whatever we want. So, if somebody is stripped from their freedom of movement, for instance, if they are in jail, right? They are locked for whatever reason. Um, can he still enjoy his freedom of thought? Yes or no? Yes. yes. So, what goes on in my mind only is between me and my God, right? That's the only dialogue I can have that nobody has control of. That's why it's law. So the freedom of thought um, is one of the major uh, concepts, right, from the law of freedom. The reason why we are going to have this conversation about the freedom of thought and the freedom of conscience is because next time I speak, I want to talk about free will. And uh, to speak about free will in the spiritist view is a complex topic that the freedom of thought and the freedom of conscience concepts will help us understand in a deeper level the true meaning of free will. So what is freedom of thought? What is thought? The million dollar question. Anybody? Well, I don't have the answer either because not even science knows, yay! So nobody knows, scientifically speaking, what thought is. There, is, there isn't still a definition for thought, scientifically speaking. We already know a lot about how thought is processed by the brain. So we are learning, uh, scientifically speaking, how the thought is processed, right? But we are far from having a understanding and having a uh, conclusion on what a thought is. We, it's funny, right? Because the whole day, our minds keep going, right? And night too. And, <laughs> and during the night too, it doesn't stop, right? And yet, nobody can conclusively give a definition of thought. So we can say that the thought is the product of a mental activity, right? Everything, it's the faculty, uh, the result, the product of our thinking, right? So when the doctrine explains to us, and that's the answer to the question, is there anything in human beings that escape all limitations? Illimited, okay? And of which they enjoy absolute freedom the absolutely freedom of thought. The answer is, 
they enjoy unbounded freedom in their thoughts. As there is no obstacle to thought, while it may be hindered, thought cannot be extinguished. Thought cannot be extinguished. Right there gives us a hint of something. What is it in nature that cannot be extinguished? Is this, is matter? <coughs> Energy, right? Energy cannot be extinguished. So the product of our thought cannot be finished, can be transformed, like Einstein said, right? But cannot be extinguished. And then there is a metaphysical law that Spiritism agrees with it, that every thought will form, will um, produce form at certain level. Doesn't mean necessarily in this physical world. But every thought, because it's some unidentified, science doesn't know, so it's an unidentified kind of energy that we don't know what it is, right? But that produces form at certain level. So it's that impulse, that energetic uh, train, that will produce thought at certain level and cannot be extinguished. Therefore, we've got to be very careful with what we think, right? And that's the hard part. Question 834, are human beings responsible for their thoughts? If the metaphysical law says that every thought produces form at certain level, are we responsible for our train of thoughts? Yes or no? Yep. And sometimes we are thinking the whole day of something and we don't even realize. That's the important of, importance of self-knowledge and self-awareness, right? If a thought keeps coming to your mind, daga, 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 the whole day, because we are not that creative, you know? When we are stuck with an idea, when we realize the whole day we were thinking about that, could be something completely not important. Like Alexandre thinks the whole day about chocolate. <laughs> chocolate, chocolate, chocolate. Right. It's a law. <laughs> So um, that's where the importance of us being vigilant of our own thoughts, of our own processes, right? Self-awareness, that's why we are here for, to be more and more aware of what goes in our minds. Makes sense so far? Are we together with the doctrine so far? So freedom of thought, um, that's why it's very interesting um, that uh, people have died for that, right? Because the freedom of thought, what is the difference of freedom of thought and freedom of conscience? Okay, let's see the definition of conscience in the dictionary. The sense of right and wrong that governs a person's thoughts and therefore their actions, right? So the freedom of thought is more like that uh, body of thoughts, right, that become what we believe in. So our sense is more like a, a sum of the thoughts, right, that have a moral consequence. It becomes our own code. It becomes our conscience, right? So, what does the doctrine say? Is freedom of conscience the natural consequence of freedom of thought? We can think of whatever we want, right? We have that freedom of think whatever we focus on, right? 
And we have to be careful because what we focus on will expand another law. So if you are thinking the whole day of things that are absolutely nonsense, that's what your body of thoughts are becoming, nonsense. If you focus in thoughts that are building who you are, that makes you stronger in your convictions, and that's where your freedom of conscience will lie. Make sense? So, the conscience is an inner thought that belongs to the individual. Like all the other thoughts are entertained by that person. So it becomes that body of beliefs and thoughts, right, that belong to me and form that moral code that I will live by. Then intuitively, that's what I start becoming more and more, um, becoming more and more who I really am. Make sense? So, we are completely free of thought, are we? So I have a question for you. How come marketing spends so much money to change our thoughts? <laughs> right, right? I personally, before I realized how much um, advertising on TV, because now it's absurd, it doesn't need to be very a genius to realize that, but in the beginning it was very slowly. And I start seeing a lot of um, commercials on TV about medication, right? And I remember one of the first ones was the, um, uh, I don't know, it's a syndrome of the leg, the restless leg syndrome. And I start seeing that all the time. And my leg started getting restless. I thought, what is wrong with this? You know, what is this syndrome? I didn't know that I had a syndrome in my leg. So now we realize that we have many illnesses that we never realized, right? So until where is my freedom of thought influenced by my surroundings? Don't we have to be aware of that? Because at one point I could swear I had the syndrome leg, restless leg. And I was like, oh my God, something is wrong with my leg. You start believing that, right? Therefore, you go to the doctor and you say, I have that syndrome. You start self-diagnosing yourself, you, doing self-diagnosis because restless leg syndrome, restless leg syndrome, okay, I got that. I have that, I think I have that. <laughs> so, it's very important that we are aware what comes in our minds, very important, because that can compromise our freedom of thought. Not the freedom of thought, but the quality of our thought, better said, right? So what about, how come marketing spends so much money to change your thought? <laughs> right, right? I personally, before I realized how much uh, advertising on TV, because now it's absurd, it doesn't need to be very a genius to realize that, but in the beginning it was very slowly. And I started seeing a lot of uh, commercials on TV about medication, right? And I remember one of the first ones was the, uh, uh, I don't know, it's a syndrome of the leg, the restless leg syndrome. And I start seeing that all the time. And my legs started getting restless. I said, what is wrong with this? You know, what is this syndrome? I didn't know that I had the syndrome in my leg. So now we realize that we have many illnesses that we never realized, right? So until where is my freedom of thought influenced by my surroundings. Don't we have to be aware of that? Because at one point I could swear I had the syndrome leg, restless leg. And I was like, oh my God, something is wrong with my leg. You start believing that, right? Therefore you go to the doctor and you say, I have that syndrome. 
You start self-diagnosing yourself. You're doing self-diagnosis because restless leg syndrome, restless leg syndrome. Okay, I got that. I have that. I think I have that. So, it's very important that we are aware what comes in our minds. Very important. Because that can compromise our freedom of thought. Not the freedom of thought, but the quality of our thought, better said, right? So what about dogmas? If a religion or a doctrine imposes a certain um, set of dogmas, is it infringing on my freedom of thought, yes or no? What do you think? No. Yes. Yes. If, if Spiritism had a dogma where it says, you've got to believe in this and you can't question it. That's what a dogma is, right? The definition of dogma is a um, belief that is established and if you are from that religion you've got to follow that religion you've got to accept that dogma as truth so it's a belief that you've got to accept as truth and you cannot question does that infringe my freedom of thought yes or no yes, yes. and the spiritism is so fantastic that in question 841, in the end of the answer, has to me one of the most, it's a, a diamond, it's one of the most wonderful sentences in the, in the book. It says, beliefs cannot be imposed. Beliefs cannot be imposed. So I cannot force anybody to think what I say is the truth. Beliefs cannot be imposed. Beliefs come from within, not from without. We as spirits have our own spiritual DNA. And we all have a very highly individualize this spiritual curriculum, right? Right? So we have an experience that is unique in our many, many lives. Therefore, what I believe right now is the sum of all this I have lived. Not only in this life, but in my many lives. And that's how I get to be who I am. Makes sense. So if I have this individualized curriculum, experience, history that makes who I am right now, because we are always transforming ourselves, hopefully, right? Nobody's stuck here, right? We can always, and we will always evolve in our ideas and in our concepts, correct? Right? Yeah. So, if we all have these different journeys, how can I impose what I feel that is right on somebody else? Can I do that? I can try, but I'm wasting my time, right? The maximum I can do is in a discussion, right, in a, in a conversation to expose my beliefs. I can do that, but I cannot force nor impose. So there is no proselytism in spiritism. I can't force anybody to be spirit, a spiritist, nor do I want to do that. Because this has to be something that comes from within each one of us, right? And spiritism might not be the answer to you. It is for me, doesn't mean it has to be the door to anybody else. So, 
Spiritism is not proselytism. We don't try and make other people believe in what we believe. We like to share what this beautiful doctrine has to offer because it's so complete. It's such a beautiful journey. So it might be useful to you or to you or to you. It forms who we are so we share. But we don't impose because we all have the opportunity to think what we want. So, some thoughts. The moment you declare a set of ideas to be immune from criticism, from satire, from derision, or content, freedom of thought becomes impossible. That's from um, uh, Rushdie, that uh, um, um, Islam guy who wrote a book like 20 years ago and had to flee to England, otherwise he would be uh, dead now. And isn't that true? Sometimes it's hard, and it's hard for us that live in a democracy. Very hard for us. Because the idea of respecting the freedom of thought of another person means that sometimes we have to hear things that we go, oh my god, how can this person be saying that? Or we look around in the world and we say, how much ignorance is that? Right? But that's part of our understanding that even if I hate that conclusion that somebody else is making, has, he's entitled, he has the right to say it, to express it, to think, to feel. And that's hard. And that's where we exercise our tolerance, isn't it? It's hard, isn't it? So um, it's like a, there was a graphic in the internet that um, was saying, um, if your religion says to kill some, to kill in the name of God, God start with yourself. <laughs> right? Because it doesn't go together to kill and God. It doesn't go in the same sentence, no matter what you say. Right? It's two opposing views. Right? Makes sense? So, let's say what Einstein said. Blind belief in authority is the greatest enemy of truth. What do you think? Blind belief in authority is the greatest enemy of the truth. What do you think? If I believe without processing in my mind what I'm listening, and with my code, my internal inner code, with my own conscience, conclude, right? Can I reach the truth? Can I be influenced? in a level where the thought is not product of who I am, but the product of society. Do I have like syndrome, right? So, what do you think? Einstein was right? Blind belief in authority is the greatest enemy of truth. What does the spiritism say? Spiritism does not have dogmas. I don't care. Or reincarnation is a dogma. No, it's not. Because I may question it. Not only I may. It's my obligation. So it doesn't impose you. You've got to believe in reincarnation. It's like the Dalai Lama said once. They, they interviewed him and they said, what if science says that reincarnation does not exist and proves it? And then he says, well, then Buddhism is going to have to follow, but it's going to be hard for them to prove that. <laughs> the same thing Kardec did. What did Kardec say? 
What happens with a tenet from the spiritism doctrine? If science finds that, oh my God, this is not true. It hasn't happened yet. But what if? What does Kardec tell us? Follow science. This is the biggest argument that anybody can give every time you hear, oh, spiritism also has dogmas. No, it doesn't. Because if Kardec says, if science proves something wrong, stay with science, it's not asking for blind faith, is it? Actually, spiritism asks for rational faith. Process through your intellect, use that, meditate, because not only intellectual knowledge that we are talking about, be careful, okay? The thought processes sometimes will mess us up. Sometimes <coughs> too much information. Sometimes we have to quiet our minds and find the truth from another source. Okay? So, Dennis Larry, the comedian, said, racism isn't born, folks. It is thought. I have a two-year-old son. Know what he hates? Maps. End of the list. Is that true? Is that true? Do we teach our kids sometimes too much? Do we force on our kids our own beliefs and shortcomings? Food for thought, isn't it? So a kid is not born a racist, right? If nobody tells any kid about any racist concept, you are gonna see those kids playing around. They don't care. They don't even notice what color the person is, how does do they look, they're gonna play, right? So it's not some truth that they are born with. Racism is thought. We teach our kids. Therefore, we've got to be careful to not infringe in their freedom of thought. When we give to them sometimes wrong information, we can give our best. And we need to leave a space for them to start reflecting and forming their own opinions. If we impose our own prejudice, there is no way that kid is not gonna raise and uh, uh, grow with those ingrained thoughts, okay? The philosopher Bertrand Russell said, we are faced with the paradoxical and uh, uh, with the fall, follow paradox. Education has become one of the obstacles to intelligence and freedom of thought. Ouch. And that's absolutely true. It is absolutely true. Education that does not invite the learner, the, the, the one who is doing the learning, to reflect is not helping in the freedom of thought, correct? How many times we, full of good intentions, right, tell our kids and decide for our kids how they should think, how they should conclude? So there has to be a balance, right, in what the, um, um, information that we pass. I'm not talking about moral values. You see the difference? We teach our kids moral values. We better have them. <laughs> Oops, right? Now when we are giving information and intellect and, and we are developing the intelligence, 
we are not leaving space for the insight. We are not leaving space for the information that comes <coughs> from beyond the material world can give to anybody. So, I think it's very true that education in the format that is restrictive, that does not invite the development of critical thinking is not helping in the freedom of thought. Um, can we, another fantastic question from this spirit's book, it says, is placing obstructions on beliefs that cause social disturbances an infringement on the freedom of conscience? And the answer is, you can only repress action. Belief is inaccessible. Don't we know that? And when we don't understand that, we meddle in wars for 25 years or 22 years, right? We can stop actions, especially the violent ones, right? But can we impose our way of thinking, our way of life, our values, our religion? No, we can't and we shouldn't, right? So, everybody knows to, to go to school in the um, Islamic world. And it, she says, they will not stop me. I will get my education. I get the motion with this girl. I will get my education if it is in home, school or any place. She got the novel, right? So, can we impose conviction? No. Can we impede a 13 or 14 year old, I don't remember, girl to think for herself? No. Right? And finally, Santa Agustin, if you believe what you like in the Gospels and reject what you don't like, it's not the Gospel you believe, but yourself. So, how can we reconcile that statement, right, with freedom of thought? If you believe what you like in the Gospels, he's talking about the Gospels, and reject what you don't like, it's not the Gospel you believe, but yourself. So, what is St. Augustine telling us here? Can I pick from the Gospels what I like and what I don't like? This I like, I'm gonna use it. This forgiveness thing, oh my God, that's too hard. I understand, but in my case, I'm not gonna do that. In that situation, it's impossible. I'm sorry, I'm not gonna do that. Right? The gospel is the moral code. That's where we make the difference between, Saint Augustine didn't say, if you believe what you like in the church doctrine. He said in the gospel. The gospel is the message, right? That message, the interpretation that I am comfortable with, with is the gospel according to spiritism. In there, I can pick and choose. Because it's the truth. So, it's not about dogma. See the difference? So I can't pick and choose dogmas of religions and say that I don't like, that I don't believe. But the gospel, the gospel is not doctrine. The gospel is truth. The gospel is 
is messenger of gospel, the messenger of God, right? The gospel is the deep meaning of what Christ was telling us. It's not the words, it's the spirit of the message. And that message becomes who we are. And then you can pick and choose. You can only make an effort to become that, because that's the right thing. <coughs> so when we internalize the message with the freedom of thought, we can follow or we cannot follow. It's going to depend on our inner preparation, on our inner development. But where we are right now, the message is the only thing that we really can't pick and choose. We can only realize gradually, become gradually, exercising it, and that belief becomes who we are. So, I'll leave with you. I had, oh no, I won't. I had a beautiful message of and Leon Denis, but I didn't bring it, so I forgot. So, this is like um, a little base for us to do the second talk about free will. Now we have you know, enough information from the doctrine to question free will and uh, see what these um, precept is really all about. Any questions? Any comments? Oh boy. Was that boring? <laughs> Any comments? Any questions? No? So, let me ask you, instead of me concluding, let me ask you. Knowing that we do have the freedom of thinking, that's the only thing that Nobody can reach, right? And people who have gone through revolutions and people who have gone through political and religious oppression know that better than anybody, right? Knowing that, knowing uh, that we do have that, what is the message in your lives, in our lives, that we can take away and use it? What do you think? What is the alert? What is the message? You shape your own thoughts and the way that you think and feel and how you project those thoughts outward to other people. Beautiful. Beautiful. It's ours. It's our own. And what we Think about it, it's who we will become. Choose your thoughts. Choose your thoughts. Be aware of your thoughts. Constantly. Constantly. Beautiful. That's exactly what I take from this, right? Many times we are being bombarded by information that don't belong to us, that have nothing to do with our progress, as a soul, as a person, as a citizen, right? So let's get all that information and process it. Not only intellectually, not only intellectually, but process in the silence of that space where we really get our answers. So, yeah, our thoughts will construct our future. So, anything else? So, I have a question. So, you were mentioning how we shouldn't impose our thoughts, right, mm -hmm. over our beliefs um, <coughs> to other people. Um, and we have the freedom to express our thoughts um, and our beliefs. But, Although we understand, though, that some beliefs and some thoughts are wrong, like racism, 
you know, you gave that example. That's wrong. Correct. We all understand that. Um, wouldn't that, wouldn't we want to change that thought, though? Wouldn't we want to fight? To Absolutely. And, but not through imposition. So, let me give you an example. Mother Teresa. One time, she was invited for a, um, Asiata, how do you call that? Um, demonstration. A demonstration, a rally, thank you. A rally against the war. I don't know which war. I don't remember, but against war. And you know what her answer was? She was bright when we get She said, when you have a rally, um, for peace, count me in. Perfect, isn't it? She wouldn't go to a rally against the war, but she would go in a rally for peace. That's why we have to focus on the positive. When you confront, you are, that's what Jesus said, give the other face, the, the other side of your face, right? So when I am in an intellectual discussion and you are there and I'm here and I am on top of my lungs saying everything that I believe and you are defending your position on top of yours, are we gonna get somewhere? No. So it's the same thing in every focus on the positive. So if racism is wrong, go to the rally for equality. Fight for equality for everybody. And that's how you win hearts. That's how you transform minds. Focus on the positive. Make sense? Anybody else? Absolutely. That's why Jesus said, give the other cheek. What did he say? Yeah, hit me, hit me some more. That's not what he meant. But if you are hit with hate, you answer with love. Is it hard? Oh boy. Not for him, for me it still is. But we make an effort. Because if you answer with the hate, you are in the same energetic field. You're not changing the field, you just have a different opposing view. But the energetic level is the same, make sense? So when you're hit with hate, you answer with love, with positive. Make sense? Anybody else? No? All good? So let's watch our thoughts. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody.